and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, Hannah Cox joins us to discuss launching based politics, her video-focused media startup company. We're going to look at how media outlets are appealing to and resonating with Generation Z and even some millennials. And with the 2024 election cycle right around the corner, we're going to discuss the issues that young Americans care about the most. But before we bring her on a little bit more about Hannah, Hannah Cox is a prominent libertarian writer, commentator, activist and the co-founder of Base Politics. She launched her show based in 2020 during the pandemic with a passion for teaching people how to think, not what to think. And she is a frequent guest on Fox News and Fox Business, and her work is commonly cited by lawmakers and leaders across the political spectrum. Hannah, a pleasure to have you on She Thinks today. So good to be here, Beverly. I'm, I'm thrilled to see you have a show because I've always loved working with you and watching yes. your work. So this is excellent. And I love to see all that you've done. You've really been able to grow a pretty big following. And you, as I just said, started Based Politics in 2020. I really want to get into the inception of that and how you decided to branch out on your own and what the response has been since you've done so. Yeah. So Base Politics has actually been a full-time job since October. So we're still in our first full year of operation, but its origins do trace back to my initial vodcast that I launched back in 2020. I had had this idea for years. I was working in public policy. I was often working with libertarian groups. So I was working with people on both the right and left on issues they could come together on. I had friends on both the right and left. I didn't really like people on both the right and left. And I just kept thinking, gosh, we're not that far apart when you really sit down and talk to people. We mostly agree on the problems that the country is facing. We just have very, very different ideas of what we should do to address those problems. And in my experience and in my conversations, that was usually due to a lack of people not really knowing where the problems started from, what their origins were. And so I just thought if you could help people understand what initially went wrong with healthcare, what really went wrong with our foreign policy and help them see that the government is usually the problem at the, at the root of it all, then we could have better solutions. We could come together on things and we could you know, really get a lot done. So that was, that was sort of the origins of BASED, my show. I launched it with literally like a little mic and my brother holding like a piece of cardboard with paper <laughs> stuck to it. So I had a makeshift teleprompter and I did that for about a year and it, it took off. It started doing very well. There was an excellent response to it. And during that time, I'd been working really closely with Brad Palumbo for about a year and a half. Um, we had both gone to fee as writers, but we were really passionate about uh, sort of the emerging new media landscape. You know, we both really like TikTok. We get our news from TikTok and from Reddit and from podcasts from from YouTube or you know your typical millennial and Gen Z people we don't watch cable news even though we're on it um, and so we thought if we really want to be able to have the kind of impact we are seeking in our political system we've got to go where the people are actually getting their news we've got to get our ideas in front of younger generations and we have to really follow the trends of where I think the media in general is going which is away from traditional news outlets and communications departments and and cable news and, and radio so so we started, you know, adding podcasts, we started adding different YouTube shows, we started doing a lot of reels and short form videos. And again, we we're just getting a really great response. And from my time working in public policy and as an advocate, I knew firsthand just how important that kind of visibility was to public policy and actually getting things across the finish line. So while we were doing that, we started partnering with people who were doing what I call the real work on the ground, which were many of my former colleagues and friends at SPN think tanks and with Americans for Prosperity and many other great you know advocacy groups that are out there and working to elevate the issues they were trying to advance through our content and trying to sort of use the content as a carrot and stick to influence lawmakers. And, and that's kind of where the the thing took off and became a lot bigger than a show. So we we filed a full nonprofit last year, started fundraising. And like I said, we went full time in October. That's great. And one of the things I think is interesting is we're seeing new media evolve and we're seeing so many different avenues. Yes, there is still that short form. So maybe it's a short reel, um, a short clip that you may see on TikTok, but also just the rise of the podcast. You take a look at someone like Joe Rogan, most popular podcast in the country, maybe even in the world, I'm not sure based on international level, but his his interviews can go up to three hours long. They're long form. Are you finding as you're doing base politics, doing the, the videos that people do want that nuance? You talk about getting to how did we get where we are? Well, you can't do that in sound bites. You have to actually dig a little deeper. Are people glad that we're getting rid of or getting away from some of the soundbite culture to get into nuance? 
I think people are desperate for nuance. I think the format in which they want to consume it differs. So certainly, you know, my first based episodes, they were well into an hour long. They were really looking at the deep origins of public policy and litigation and Supreme Court decisions to figure out how we got from the beginning to where we are now with various issues. And they did very well. So I think there is sort of an audience for both. Some people do not have the attention span for that. And they're going to gravitate toward short form video and reels and TikToks and Instagram. So, you know, we kind of believe in covering the gap. And, and oftentimes it, as content creators, it's really easy to do because if you produce a piece of long form content, like a video podcast or, or something of that nature or YouTube video, you can then splice it up and take smaller clips from it and put those on other platforms and maybe even use those as sort of an advertisement to drive people to the longer form videos. So I like both. Um, but I will say the reachability of short form video is, is mm -hmm. astounding. the average podcast. And we're, you know, we've been in the top 1% of podcasts since I launched my show. That's actually not hard to do because it's, you know, you get like 5,000 plus listeners per episode and you're in the top 1%. Most podcasts just simply don't have that many listeners. The gap between somebody being in the top 1% to the 0.001% of Joe Rogan having millions and millions of downloads is really extreme. You're probably not going to be the Joe Rogan where you've got millions of people tuning into your long form video, but a TikTok can easily get a million views. You know, we, we frequently get million views on, on Instagram reels and TikToks. And so it does, um, you do need to be on both, I think. And I do you think younger people are more inclined to the shorter form video content. They just don't have the attention span, unfortunately. Um, and so I, I think that it's important to be very concise, to be able to sort of pack a punch. And again, to have a lot of content out there. You know, people often comment, I can't keep up with everything you're doing. You're putting out so much content at once. And it's like, yeah, you kind of have to, to keep consistently getting in front of those people and keep getting short form stuff to them. Um, but I, I, you know, that's not to say that longer form stuff can't succeed. It has its own sort of pocket. And, and I personally prefer that. Right. <laughs> you're asking my opinion. <laughs> Well, you even, I, I mentioned this in your bio, but you talk about teaching people how to think, not what to think. So this goes around this idea of critical thinking skills as a whole, which I think academia is not preparing young people for critical thinking skills. You even think about how this idea of free speech, people having an open dialogue with people who they disagree with is just thought of as a, an offensive thing these days, that the worst thing you could do is offend someone. How do you help people think critically in today's environment? Yeah, I love that question, Beverly. And I don't know if you and I have ever talked about our own um, academic backgrounds, but I was homeschooled predominantly throughout eighth grade. And then I started going to more traditional formats of school. But I was actually taught logic as a as a full class that I got throughout middle school. And I just don't think that's something most people are provided with. And I'm really passionate about that because I think if I were to just come in and say, you should think this way about these issues, you know, my views are informed by a belief in capitalism, by a belief in limited government, by a belief in individual liberty. But I can tell people that and I can use buzzwords and they're not going to have the ability to distinguish between what policies match up with those ideas and what aren't. As long as somebody's saying they're a capitalist, they're going to go along with it. And I think we've seen this in the Republican Party, especially in the past 10 years. You have a ton of people running around saying that they're capitalists who are nothing but the sort. Um, but most people can't distinguish between, you know, a Rand Paul and a Donald Trump. And I think that that's a huge problem. So instead of just teaching people, you know, you should feel this way about this policy, we have to go deeper than that and actually teach them how to ascertain what policies match up with the views that they say they ascribe to? What actually is capitalism? Brad and I just covered a poll on our show this week where they were asking college students their opinions on various things. And unsurprisingly, most of them were anti-capitalism. But when you asked them to describe capitalism, they said it was a system where people could bribe the government and the government gave special favors and basically described corporate welfare and cronyism and corporatism, which is actually an attack on capitalism. So we're really passionate about trying to help people understand the, the base on um, and that's part of the reason the show is name based. The, the base understanding of things kind of give people a foundation that they can build upon so that when they're presented with new ideas or new public policies, they can think through that on their own and sort of evaluate whether it matches up or not. And I actually want to give huge credit to Justin Amash on this because I feel like I've always been a huge fan of his. Um, he was sort of coming up as a, as a young lawmaker as I was first getting into politics. And he had this habit of posting every single vote that he made, but explaining why, why this bill was constitutional, why it was. And it, it did a lot for me to help me learn how to think through things in that in that way. So I'm kind of trying to take that same energy and apply it to all these other formats. Well, I'm glad you were talking about capitalism because when I looked at your Twitter bio, one of I think it's the first thing you have on there. You call yourself a rabid capitalist. <laughs> what type of responses do you get, especially from young people when you just come out with that right away? 
Yeah, it's kind of a lightning rod. I mean, I think that most people are more curious because I, I think this is a huge problem. Um, people in our camp, they shy away from defending things like capitalism and they'll, they'll try to soften it and say, well, say free market or say this. I'm against that. I think people mostly use the word capitalism. I understand some of the critiques for, for its origins, but that's the most common word in our vernacular. That's what most people are using to discuss our economic system. That's what most people on the left are familiar with. And so I think that when you can kind of toss that lightning rod out there and be like, not only do I support capitalism, I am rabidly in favor of it. It, it tends to kind of pique people's curiosity because they're so used to hearing it denounced and people being shameful about it and maybe trying to even um, hide a little bit of what they think or, or what their true values are that when you really take a stand, it's like Billy Graham said, when a strong man takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. I think it helps other people come out and say, yeah, capitalism is actually a great thing. It has done more to advance humanity has done more to increase the quality of life than any other system known to man. Um, and then for those who might be opposed, it makes them kind of step back and think maybe I'm missing something here. If this person is so openly in favor of this, maybe I need to dig deeper because there's something I'm missing. So let's get into how we should talk to young voters about issues. So you talk about that lightning rod of just coming out and saying capitalism. But I think part of it is maybe getting a better understanding of what millennials, what Generation Z specifically, where they're getting their news, what they think about issues. You talked about the different social media platforms. Is that where most young people, first of all, are going to get their news? It is. Actually, TikTok has become, I think, the second or third largest search engine in this country. And so for a lot of people, especially older demographics, when we talk about this, they have this perception that TikTok is like this silly app where people are doing dances. And I mean, there is still some of that, but TikTok is a wealth of information. That's why I said, I personally love it. I get a ton of information and news from TikTok. There's tons of professionals and all kinds of vocations on there providing free wisdom and information. Um, so I think that that is a really important format to be on. It's, it's dwarfing the competition when it comes to daily users, especially in that demographic of younger people, people under 30. There's, there's nothing even that you could compare to it, frankly. And then YouTube would be, you know, pretty closely behind it. I think oftentimes, especially in my previous work, there's been sort of a focus on Facebook or Twitter. And, you know, those those can be good organizing platforms, Facebook, especially if you're doing coalition work or grassroots kind of work. Twitter, I think, is a great networking app, but it's, it's niche. You're, you're really kind of around other people who are in the journalism, political class, and it's not really reaching the grassroots and masses the way that something like TikTok or YouTube is. So I think that we've got to get better about learning how to succeed on those platforms and also finding ways to make content that is both educational, but also entertaining. And because you're not going to succeed on TikTok, you just come in and start, you know, droning on about economics. You have to find ways to actually talk about things that are happening in the world and relate it to them. One example I would think of that recently is when the Titanic submarine blew up. Um, there was a ton of anti-capitalist content going on on TikTok about that. People literally celebrating these billionaires dying, you know, saying the ocean's eating the rich. Ha ha ha. Isn't that so funny? And of course, we were aghast at that, but we use this to sort of make our point about how communism is dehumanizing and it pushes class warfare and, and, and kind of relate it to something that was already trending algorithmically so that the content could take off. So it was still entertaining to people who are not you know, necessarily looking for political or economic content, but while you're still educating people, sometimes without them even knowing it. So I think I know what your answer is going to be from a legislative perspective, um, but I'm curious what you think about this aspect of those who say... You shouldn't be on TikTok because of China and privacy concerns. So there is the talk about whether or not it should be legislated. Some are pushing for TikTok to be banned either on a state statewide or maybe even nationally. What is your thought on a ban and why do you what I would assume is not have many privacy concerns or at least you're on it. So you're not concerned enough to not be on it. What do you say? Yeah, so we were actually one of the first right wing organizations to speak out against the TikTok bill. I think it's called the Restrict Act. It is that is a Trojan horse of a bill. It is basically the Patriot Act 2.0. If you're concerned about privacy, I have no godly reason why you would give the U.S. government more ability to get your information. For me, I'm far more concerned with the U.S. government having my information and spying on me than I am China. Uh, China has no ability to hurt me right now. The U.S. government absolutely does. So that's more of my concern. I find it really hypocritical that people who are, you know, have no issues with the tremendous amount of warrantless spying the U.S. government has done since 2001 
have such an issue with this. I, I think it is a little bit one of those things where they um, like to rile people up over China. They like to stoke tensions. And it looks like they're doing something effective. Uh, again, it's a Trojan horse of a bill. I don't think that TikTok's um, policies, we've looked into this, they're no worse than Twitter's policies or Facebook's policies. Yes, they are collecting your data. They are mostly collecting your data so that their algorithm feeds you content to where you never want to get off. And that's, that's a good thing for a business, right? And honestly, as a consumer, I like it. I'm constantly fed content that I relate to, that I want to see. I often joke TikTok knows me better than my mom. They show me exactly the kinds of things I'm interested in. So I, I'm, I don't really have concerns about that. I, I have not seen anything actually produced um, by the people who are sort of pushing for these kinds of initiatives that says that this is some terrifying thing. In fact, TikTok's been pretty um, apt to play ball with them and be tr pretty transparent with uh, their practices and have I don't know, as far as I can tell, are completely complying with all investigations. So I think it's very overblown. And I'm, I'm like I said, I'm far more concerned about the contents of that bill than I am with anything TikTok's doing. And it's not surprising that it's typically young people who are better at using TikTok than somebody who is older. How are legislators, members of Congress, how are they doing with these platforms? Do you usually cringe when you see them try it? Or are there some members of Congress that are actually using TikTok well? I think there's some members of Congress whose staffs are using TikTok <laughs> well. <laughs> no, they um, it's it's quite cringeworthy when you hear them talk about any social media platforms because even just their vernacular around it quickly reveals they have no clue what they're talking about. And you know, I'm not trying to throw older people under the bus. When I first started using TikTok, I joked that I needed to make an eight year old friend real fast to figure it out because the back end wasn't that easy. It was it's kind of complicated to figure out how to make videos on TikTok. It's actually got amazing functionality once you figure it out. But um, yeah, it, it's something that took me a while to learn. So I, I, I'm not throwing them under the bus if they haven't figured it out and, unless they're coming in and trying to regulate something that they don't understand. And I certainly think that would be most of them. I always think the hearings on big tech are the most cringeworthy as the different members are trying to talk about social media and try to understand it and search engines. It's it's always just very obvious they don't have any clue about it. Yeah. Um, but I know with election 2024, it's never too early to talk about it. It's around the corner. You do have a good sense of the pulse of young people and what they're thinking about. I thought we would do kind of a let's go down different issues. Do they care about what is resonating? The issue I think about that is is probably resonating quite well is this issue of climate change or it's an issue that, that young people care about. Am I correct about that? that do most young people care about climate change? Yeah, I mean, you're correct in polling that most people would say they care about it. I will say, and again, you know, algorithm could have something to do with this, but I, it's not something I see people talking about that much. I actually would say there's a lot more people who are very, very concerned with their economic prospects. Um, there's, I would say the sentiment amongst younger people right now is that they're kind of screwed. They feel like they're up a creek. They, of course, are again, blaming all of the wrong things for why that is. I, I don't disagree with them. I think there's a lot financially going wrong. Um, you know, they're they're concerned about never being able to buy a house. They're concerned about not having a good quality of life. They're concerned about debt. I think those are the issues that seem more animating to me from being somebody who's very, very online. Those are the things that they're talking about more. Uh, climate change, I do think they care about. I don't know if it's something that gets them out to vote. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of the real question when you come to an election season. There's, to be honest, not many issues that really turn people who are younger generations out to vote. It takes a lot to get them there. Um, but I think things like the student debt cancellation, we saw Biden try to shove through. I think that's because that is something younger people really do care about that actually is animating to them. It's something they can tangibly see. I vote for this person or I go vote for this thing and I get $10,000, I get $20,000. I think that is a little bit easier to wrap your head around. Whereas with climate change, they care about it. I'd say they're concerned about it. But a lot of the policies, you know, they're not very tangible and for good reason, because they're really just communism <laughs> cloaked under right. climate change concern. They're not going to do anything to address the climate. They're just going to make everybody poorer and worse off. Um, but I think for that reason, they are not as activated by that topic when it comes to voting. Now, certainly as far as polls go, they're going to rate it highly, something they care about. Let's talk about the issue of free speech. So I know you and I care very deeply about free speech. IWF cares very much about free speech. There does seem to be this trend where you're not allowed to use certain words. You have to use the right pronouns for a person, how they identify. This idea that words matter so much and that language should be regulated and that language should be changed. Those types of issues revolving around free speech, how much do they resonate? 
Uh, I would love to give you good news, but everything we're seeing is very bleak and it's not just bleak on the left. Brad and I also just covered a new poll that came out with college students um, over the past week where it found both left wing and right wing college students thought that they should be able to turn their professors in for saying a number of statements. And they ranged on the left from saying things like um, there are two genders or that the COVID everybody should get the COVID vaccine um, to people on the right having issues with professor said something that was anti-gun. And so I think that this is something that kind of keeps me up at night. It is we are quickly losing the sense of defending anybody's free speech on both sides. And, and I think that, you know, we often see it more pervasively on the left with their censorship campaigns and targeting social media to shut people down. But somewhat under the radar, I've covered this a lot because I care about these issues. We've actually seen a lot of Republican states passing really bad anti-free speech bills, specifically trying to target tech companies and things like Section 230. Both Florida and Texas Republicans have passed just absolutely atrocious, unconstitutional bills in the past year. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really worried because I don't think that free speech is popular at all right now. It's, it's popular as long as you're getting to say what you want. But the respect for other people to be able to say what they want when you disagree with it, that's really dying quite quickly. And I think it comes down to something we're trying to address at base, which is that people want to shut down speech when they cannot defend their own ideas. And, mm -hmm. and I think that that's because they lack a foundation for why they think what they think. You know, there's very much a tribal mentality. People are on one side or the other. They don't actually know how to defend themselves. They don't know how to encounter views that are different than theirs or debate them. And so they want to just make them go away. I think if we can give people a more solid understanding of their worldview and how they engage with the world, hopefully some of that would dissipate. But we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, teaching people how to think like this is what you're what you're doing there. And really final question for you. I was curious about this because we see so much of this on cable news. And that is a lot of stories, especially on the right, talking about Joe Biden's age and also the issues revolving around Hunter Biden. How much does Biden's age and Hunter Biden, how much do they resonate with young people? I think the age question, I want to separate the two, the age question matters to young people a lot and not just for Joe Biden, but period. I think there is a prevailing sense that all of our politicians are far too old. They're completely disengaged from the real world. They are not going to have to suffer the consequences of the ideas that they're pushing on the rest of us. So I think if you were to ask anybody under, you know, boomer age, if we wanted to have a ban on on certain ages being a politician after a certain time, it would probably succeed overwhelmingly. So I think that is something people care about. Again, I don't think it's something that really particularly hurts Joe Biden because, you know, Trump is also old. Most people in Congress are also old. So I don't think that he particularly stands out on this issue, but it is something people are quite tired of. When it comes to Hunter, that is not only entirely a right wing fascination. It is a right wing boomer fascination. That's why it's all over cable news. Their viewers are older people. Younger people do not care about this story at all. They're not seeing it. It's not out there. I've, I've never seen anybody my age or younger talking about Hunter Biden on any platform other than maybe Twitter. So I, I don't think that it resonates. I don't even think they, I don't think they even know. Like if you were to pull the average young person on the street right now and ask them what Hunter's done, I don't think they'd have any idea. And so final question for you, for those who are young people listening to this and want to know where to find you, or if we have some parents or grandparents listening who want to point their children towards your content, where should they go? Yeah, well, we'd love to connect with people. Our website is based-politics.com. You can also donate there. We are a 501c3 if people want to support the work. And then you can find us at our individual handles. We really believe that where media is going is away from organizations. People trust individuals. They trust independent journalists. They trust influencers. So Based Politics is sort of the hub, the brand under which we are making content, but everything will always be under our own name. So you can find me at Hannah D. Cox on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all the above. You can find Brad Palumbo, uh, my business partner, likewise under his handles of Brad Palumbo. And then as we add new personalities, as we grow, we're hoping to add a lot more young, charismatic people with effective voices who can also start making content. Um, they will kind of fall under the Base Politics brand, but we'll always try to elevate the individuals. Well, thank you so much for your work, especially on teaching people how to think. I think the critical thinking skills and delving into nuance is such an important aspect of that. And that is something that you're doing so well. So thank you for your work and also for joining us on She Thinks Hannah Cox. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beverly.
And thank you all for joining us. IWF does want you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. And investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. So please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting IWF.org backslash donate. That is IWF.org backslash donate. Last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or review. It does help. And we'd love it if you shared this episode so your friends can know where they can find more She Thinks. From all of us here at IWF, Thanks for watching.